Um, ACM, ACIA, GECASLA. My name is Sonnet Labe. I'm a professor in English, literature, and in creative writing here at VIU. I'm uh, the chair of the Creative Writing and Journalism Department, and also the chair of the committee that chooses the Ralph Gustafson Distinguished Chair of Poetry um, each year. I'd like to acknowledge and thank um, the Snanaimo, the Snanawas, the Kotsen, and the Tlatman people on whose traditional lands we're teaching, learning, researching, living, and sharing knowledge. Um, I just wanted to say for personally um, and that I've been living in Nanaimo now for about four years um, on Nanaimo territory, and I am um, the, the way that having a role at the university and teaching literature and going out to the community and talking about language, um, that that's part of my work has only meant that I've had the opportunity to learn um, learn a lot about where I am and I continue to learn in, the, in an evolving way um, about what it means to live and be um, a person descended from African heritage, of South Asian heritage, and French Canadian settler heritage living here on Snow territory. And I really am deeply grateful to the people that I've met who taught me so generously and openly Haichka Homa Mistima to to those people. Um, yeah. Okay. I'd also like to thank uh, the Faculty of Arts and Humanities uh, for their ongoing support of this chair. Uh, Dean Marnie Stanley would have liked to be here and would have uh, said some words to you tonight, but she is um, under the weather and couldn't make it tonight. Um, I'd like to thank Paul Watkins and Joy Googler who are the, and Rhonda Bailey, who are the other members of the Ralph Gustafson Committee. Um, thank also Faye Dells, who does all the, the finance work for um, setting everything up. Thank you to the catering folks, uh, the IU catering folks who are going to be doing, who are helping with the reception or putting on the reception that's happening right after this lecture. So uh, after Gregory Schofield speaks, please join us across the hall for snacks and a cash bar. Uh, the bookstore is here selling books outside. You may have seen them as you come in. Um, thank you to them. Thanks to Tara, Bernice, and Sarah up there, uh, media studies students who are helping record the event tonight. So what I'm going to do is I'll just tell you a little bit about Ralph Gustafson, for whom the award and this theater are named. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit the official kind of bio for um, Gregory Schofield, our distinguished chair. And then I'll turn the mic over to Lori Meyer Dries, who will speak more fulsomely to tonight's speaker. So for six decades, Ralph Gustafson shared his love of language with many generations of poets. He wrote over two dozen books of poetry, a collection of essays, and a book of short stories. He compiled the first anthology of Canadian poetry, published by Penguin in 1942, and was a music critic for over a decade before he came in New York, before he came back to Canada in 1963. His book, Fire on Stone, published in 1974, won a Governor General's Award for Poetry, and The Configurations at Midnight won the 1993 Q Spell A.M. Klein Poetry Prize. Ralph Gustafson was a member of the Order of Canada, a co-founder and life member of the League of Canadian Poets. If any of you are poets, you might want to think about joining the League of Canadian Poets. Uh, and a life member of Keble College, Oxford. He won the Queen's Silver Jubilee Medal uh, and degrees from bishops. I won't go on to all the awards. He won many awards for his poetry and died, died in 1995. He cared deeply about poetry's place in the world and spent his life supporting uh, poets in Canada. After his death, um, in 1998, the Ralph and Betty Gustafson Trust was established here at VIU by his estate. And if you're interested uh, in donating it's, it's to the university or donating specifically to that prize, you can talk to me or uh, talk to me a little bit about that when we circulate after. Um, so with the support of Ralph's widow, Betty Gustafson, the Trust endows this annual chair of poetry, uh, which is devoted to advancing Canadian poetry and uh, indigenous poetry in the territory called Canada and recognizing a career, um, an, like, an esteemed career of poetry. Other uh, honorees have included Don, Dion Brand, Don Mackay, Jan Zwicky, Aaron Moray, Red Roy, and Lorna Crozier. So this year's Distinguished Poet um, for the 2019-2020 academic year is Gregory Schofield. 
Gregory Schofield is the chief of Cree, Scottish, and European immigrant, immigrant descent, whose ancestry can be traced to the Métis community of Kinnesota, Manitoba, and to Bacon <coughs> Ridge, a former Métis road allowance community that's now part of the Evan Flow First Nation. He has taught creative writing and First Nations and Métis literature at Laurentian University, Brandon University, Emily Carr University of Art and Design, and the Alberta University of the Arts. He currently holds the position of Associate Professor in the Department of Writing at the University of Victoria. So I'm going to say this again, I said it at the gathering place for those creative writing students who are thinking of doing an MFA uh, and like what you hear and want to work with Greg, that's where he is. Um, he won the Dorothy Livesay Poetry Prize in 1994 for his debut collection, The Gathering, Stones for the Medicine Wheel, and since then has published seven further volumes of poetry, including Witness I Am, which is available outside there. He has served as writer in residence at the University of Manitoba, the University of Winnipeg, and Memorial University of Newfoundland. He's the recipient of the Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal. That's the same one as Gustafsson, it sounds like. Uh, and most recently, the Writers' Trust of Canada Latiner Poetry Prize, awarded to a mid-career poet in recognition of a remarkable body of work. Further to writing and teaching, Schofield is also a skilled bead worker, and he creates in the medium of the tradi traditional Métis arts. He continues to assemble a collection of mid to late 19th century Cree Métis artifacts, um, which I've been fortunate to see because I'm one of uh, Greg Schofield's Facebook friends, and it's like a, a, this beautiful education in um, Cree Métis arts uh, when he posts his work and his finds. Schofield's first memoir that he wrote 20 years ago called Thunder Through My Veins was republished and reissued last, just this fall, 2019. So that's all the official stuff. Um, Lori Meyer Dries, who has been a faculty member in Indigenous and Homeless Studies since 1998, is going to speak, uh, is going to introduce Greg Schofield more fulsomely. Please welcome Lori Meyer Dries. relatives, colleagues, visitors. It really is an honor to be here tonight and um, with you and with our respective guest here, Gregory Schofield. My name is Laurie Meyerdries, as Sonnet introduced me, and I'm a faculty member in Indigenous Homework Studies here at uh, Vancouver Island University. As an instructor in our department, I do want to share our beautiful Hopaminam language that we try to practice in class routinely to acknowledge you and your time as an audience, and also to acknowledge our esteemed guest. So I say, I was really excited when I found out that our guest speaker tonight is now on faculty at the University of Victoria. This really is something very exciting for me. It was years ago when I first met Greg and heard him read his poetry at VIU. And I have to say that my deep and sincere appreciation of poetry comes from his work. His words spoke to landscapes that I knew, histories that I understood, and spirits that I encountered. Those words that he used changed my life, and also my understanding. Since then, I've always included Greg's work in our classroom, as some of you students may know. And uh, I really do think that uh, it's an important part of our curriculum. I like to think of myself as an original fan girl, and so I present myself as uh, unbiased in that way. So you can imagine that it means a great deal to me to be able to introduce him to you this evening and open the floor for him. But you came to hear Greg talk, not so much me. Um, but maybe a few words I can add might give a little bit more weight to what he shares with all of you this evening speaking on, of course, why Indigenous literatures matter. Uh, in preparing this brief introduction, I did do the little wiki search, the little surf around on the interwebs to see what Gregory Schofield looks like in that domain. And I came across a lot of glowing reviews written by credible writers and literati. Quotes that I harvested from that surfing included, his forms embrace the musical, the documentary, 
and the experimental in a vision of risk and generosity. Another scholar said, Schofield's range of subject work and style dazzle. This is high praise indeed, and well earned, I must say. There's many other comments uh, to speak to his refined artistry, obviously, but I just wanted to give you a few quotes. Obviously, I'm not a literary scholar. I don't know very much about creative writing, about fine literary critique, or literary theory, or history, or anything related to literature. I mean, a self-identified English dropout. And I'm not proud of it, but that is the truth. I never took an English course at university. I managed to somehow, to tell you the truth, I took Cree language. And that meant a lot to me at the time, and it still does today. So what do I see? What can I bring to you about Gregory Schofield's work? besides telling me that it's incredibly beautiful. Well, Greg and I share a teacher, a friend, and a relative in the person of Métis elder and scholar Maria Campbell. I know that she's been a great influence on his life as a writer, and it's through her that I see a side of Greg's work that can be underscored for our audience tonight. From an Indigenous perspective, Greg is part of a long line of noteworthy voices who bring out the words of the communities, who bring out the sounds of the land, and who brings out the voices of the leaders and their relationships to one another. He is a link in the chain of Indigenous speakers, people like Chief Mistamasqua, Big Bear, Louis Riel, Edward Ahenakew, Eleanor Brass, Basil Johnson, George Blondin, to name just a few of those folks east of the Rockies, but also those here in BC, people like George Cludesey, Colossalwood, Dan George, Lee Miracle, and so forth. Some of these individuals are portrayed as storytellers. Some are portrayed as poets, some as chiefs, rebels, whatever. In my generation, their words were either ignored or classified as fiction, poetry, or children's stories. In fact, there are so much more than these categories. Their art was and is political, daring, and were, was and is beautiful. For generations, their words were cloaked or purposefully hidden because they challenged Canada's views of itself. When I first began studying Indigenous political movements as a young scholar and as a young student, Maria Campbell encouraged me to look at Indigenous writers and to listen to storytellers. She showed me Edward Hennecke, a Cree minister, and had me listen to the stories and songs of her aunties and uncles. There, hiding in plain sight, were loud and proud political manifestos. Edward Hennecke wrote short stories as told by a nameless old man or old Kiyam. You might be familiar with his work. At first glance, they were innocent tellings of life after the disappearance of the buffalo, something children or young people might appreciate. But a deeper look revealed forceful political statements on indigenous identity <coughs> and rights and cultural teachings especially. As early as the 1900s and carrying right on through the 1980s and even till today, these poets, storytellers, and writers challenged Canada's authority over their communities. They challenged the silence that had been imposed on Indigenous communities through loss of lands, loss of educational opportunities, lost economies, and even lost lives. Perhaps more than this, they challenged their readers to notice that they had a voice, that they were not silent, and that life went on. Today we are in an era of reconciliation. It's a word on every politician's lips and celebrated in our institutions. Perhaps a significant first step in truly listening is to notice that Indigenous literature is about power. It demonstrates a voice, a presence, and a life that will never be quiet. As such, it renounces tragedy and victimly. I thank you for listening and turn you to Greg. <laughs> Good evening, Lori. Thank you for the, um, the beautiful introduction. I just came from the, the stairs up there. I, I feel like I'm coming down for the price is right. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm about as nervous as if I was on the price is right. 
It's so wonderful to um, to be here this evening, um, to see all of you. Before I begin, I uh, of course, uh, I've got a few little notes here, but uh, before I begin, of course, I would like to acknowledge, um, as is always important, to be able to acknowledge the territories of the Snowmano people. And I give my humble thanks, my humble appreciation, in Cree, we say Kananaskunten, Kananaskuntenua, Haichta, for having me in your territories, for being here to share my stories. I'd also like to take this opportunity, of course, to acknowledge and honor, um, this is important for me, to be able to honor and to acknowledge the land protectors across this country that are working to protect with Sotin territories. Mm -hmm. Um, I would also like to extend my gratitude uh, to the university here, to Vancouver Island University, and in particular, Sonnet Lebe. Sonnet, where are you? There you are. Sonnet, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for all of the work that you've done to, um, to bring me in. Um, I very much appreciate all the work that you've done. And of course, um, I want to acknowledge um, uh, this lecture, uh, Ralph Gustafson, the distinguished poet, um, lecture series, and for um, being invited to be uh, a distinguished uh, poet with uh, this lecture. This is truly um, uh, an honor. When I had received the invitation, I was, uh, I was very, very honored, and I'm still very honored, so thank you again. And of course, I would like to acknowledge all of you and say thank you. I have much gratitude that you came tonight to, uh, to listen to me. The um, lecture, the piece actually that I wanted to uh, share with you tonight, of course, is called um, Why Indigenous Literatures why Indigenous Literatures Matter. And it's important for you to know that um, this lecture, and specifically the title of this lecture, is a response to uh, Cherokee writer and scholar Daniel Heath Justice, who works at the University of British Columbia. This is a response to his 2018 book of the same title, which is called Why Indigenous Literatures Matter. His book uh, is described as follows. Uh, it is part survey of the field of indigenous literary studies, part cultural history, and part literary polemic. Why Indigenous Literatures Matters asserts the vital significance of literary expression to the political, creative, and intellectual efforts of indigenous peoples today. His book is an important read for anybody who is teaching Indigenous literature for anybody who are bringing Indigenous writers into their classrooms, for anybody who are working with Indigenous students, Indigenous writers, Indigenous uh, students. This book is very important. We're living in a time now, um, thankfully, of where there has been a real resurgence. There's been a real, um, I hope, uh, oh, uh, continued interest in not only indigenous literature, but what is happening um, in this country and how that is affecting all of us. Of course, I'm talking about things like climate change, I'm talking about our lands, I'm talking about our waters. And of course, to keep those things healthy, to um, um, keep those things uh, in a state that will continue to provide us life we all need to work together. We need to work together as indigenous people. We need to work together as non-indigenous people. So the lecture that I actually have prepared and that I have for you tonight is really my personal response. It's, it's really, it's a story. I'm gonna be telling you stories. It's a story about why indigenous literature matters and I want to tell you a personal story about why Indigenous literature matters. 
The piece that I'm going to share with you tonight is called Ogichi Tawak. And in Cree that means the worthy young men. Ogichi Tawak is a way to say warriors. So traditionally we would say Ogichi Tawak, they were the worthy young men. And we would also say Ogichi Tawak, Ogichi Tawak. Which are worthy young women, which are warrior women. The first part of this story is written in a voice much older than mine, a voice whose first language is Nihiawiwen Cree. And it is written in a voice that I hope to one day earn, to one day grow into. Now, this story I'm about to tell is not in the form of a lecture. I do not want my words to float up to the ceiling or to slip beneath the door cracks. The story I am going to tell is a bundle to unwrap later when you are quiet in yourself or when you are about to walk into dreams. Now, I'm going to tell another story. I'm going to tell about worthy young men. And now I'm going to speak my words, my story carefully. About 10 years ago, maybe 13 years now, I traveled to Saskatoon for my niece's graduation. She was one of the first in our family to graduate, my niece. We bought a dress for her in Calgary when we lived there. It was coral, the color of the inside of a shell. She was happy, my niece, on her special day. This was maybe 13 years ago now. After the ceremony, I went for a walk. It was a hot day in June. I walked past the old neighborhood where I had lived a poor life. I walked along the railroad tracks where once as a young man, I had passed out. But on this day after the ceremony, I was dressed in fancy clothes with expensive shoes. I thought to myself, that boy on the railroad tracks was lucky to come this far. That way, it's true, I thought this to myself. Anyway, on this day, I went to visit an antique store that had many nice things I liked. It was owned by a Muniashko, a non-Indigenous woman. And that store was situated in a bad neighborhood, and it was hidden away on a side street. But that woman had quite a few customers, and she did good business, for she had many nice things. On this day, however, there was no one in that store except for me. I was minding my business, looking through some old things, when four four Cree young men came into that store. I thought to myself, oh my goodness, what do these young men want in here? I don't think these young men are here looking for candles or fancy napkins. <laughs> now, I asked a long time ago, I worked with young offenders, so I could see these young men were up to no good. This one, he went to the farthest part of the store. Now the other two, they went to another part. And then one of them, he went up to the counter and started talking to that woman. Oh, I thought to myself, those boys are just trying something. Soon enough, that woman came up to me and asked me to stay in the store because she was scared. Okay, I told her, I will watch these boys. I wonder who is that white man over there? Those boys must have thought to themselves. Here I was all dressed in good clothes and shoes and unfair skin to begin with. Now that woman, I could see she was becoming more scared, and I thought to myself, how will I get these boys to go out of her store? Then this thought came to me. Hey, you guys, I said in a loud voice, come outside with me to have a smoke, I told them. And so those boys followed me outside. There was an old bench sitting by the front door, and those boys just sat there. I gave them each a smoke. Where do you come from? I asked them. Those boys looked me up and down. Only Nehiawak, only other Crees asked those questions, and I'm sure those boys thought, why is this Munyao asking this? <laughs> Do you work here? One of those boys said. No, I told him. Oh, well, he said, what do you do? 
I'm a poet, I told him. A Cree poet, and I write the Nihiawiwin. Now those boys look me up and down, puffing away on their cigarettes, their eyes just narrow. So you don't work here, another one said. No, I told him. Where do you come from then, another one said. My mom's family comes from Manitoba, they're Cree Métis, I said. Oh, he said, have you ever published anything? <laughs> now I was standing in front of those boys while they sat there. Yes, I said, I published quite a few books. Really? One of them said. What do you write then? Another one said. Now, I thought to myself, what is the point of telling them the names of my books? It will be like I'm bragging, and that's what these boys are taught to do by hurting other people, or because they don't have many good things to brag about, like graduating or traveling all over the world. These boys, I thought to myself, are the same age as me when I passed out by the railroad tracks, only just a few blocks from here. These boys, I said to myself, probably don't have a bundle of stories or any reason to find them. So this is what I told them. Here, this is what I write, I said. I wrote this poem for a university professor who told me one time I was angry. It's called, Not Too Polite Poetics. <laughs> <laughs> His diagnosis was not conclusively cutting edge, nor was the conversation charming, like was I a closet peace pipe smoker, or did I eat rabbits with the fur still on, but what was my teepee creeping technique, did I make my move closing time, sneak up, cruise past, make those heads tilt, I swing, just this way boy, or simply hang around looking seductively stoic like a Curtis portrait, waiting and contemplating their move out west, I discovered I didn't need to graduate I, or I didn't need to kiss up to graduate head of the class despite the prerequisite keeping my mouth in check. Not polite to stick my grudge nose in their native lit class, say my piece on First Nations first voice. Demand can sell a visit whole bima or take a course in pre-colloquial <laughs> syntax like all First Nations writers, I must adhere to ethnic demands. Make my poet's entrance wrapped in a Pendleton blanket. Sunburst geometric design. Maybe a Navajo ring or two to give me the authentic look. A ghost, a ghost, stand, shirt, a ghost stand shirt to reflect history bullets when I get too mouthy for their comfort. They want Yeats, Dickinson, a cozy chit-chat afterward. I barely passed the visiting poet's test. Answer why I'm so angry, so impolite. is not what I want here, but the chance to speak without backs up or a drum solo. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was just pacing back and forth while telling them my poem. When I finished, I threw my cigarette butt down like this and I just stepped on it. <laughs> That's what I write, I told those boys. <laughs> those boys sat there with their eyes all big, and one of them said, holy fuck was that ever cool. <laughs> then one of those boys, the leader, I think he said to me, I write too. I like to write songs. I've written a lot of songs. The other boys nodded their heads. That's awesome, I said. When I was your age, I was living here in Saskatoon, and I started writing. I wanted to be a writer because no one else was telling my story. I wanted to be a writer, I told them, because I'd seen a lot of shit, and I wanted it out of my head and out of my dreams. Those boys nodded their heads. It's good to write, I told them, because you own those stories and because you can write your own ending. You don't have to wait for other people to write it. I gave each of those boys another smoke, and we talked some more. Then they all piled into their truck and took off. It was an old dark blue truck, the color I used to see when I got mad. Then that woman from the store came outside. She asked me how I made those boys leave. I told them a story, I said. That woman didn't understand. Mm -hmm. Those kids could be my son, I told her. And if they were my boys, I would want the best for them. If they were in trouble, I would like for someone to tell them a story. That day, I walked back to my hotel along the riverbank. In the late afternoon sun, the South Saskatchewan River snaked through the valley like a blanket of shooting stars. 
This is what our stories at Chimuena are like, I thought to myself. This is what our words, Bikisquiwanan, are each, are like each a constellation of the sound of our being, each a ceremony of sound, each a small stone to be skipped across the water. And now I'm finished telling my story. I wonder what became of those young men. And I wonder if they are fathers. Me, I wonder a lot of things all of these years later. But today, as I tell this, I wonder if I had a son, would he be good in his bones? Would he be a red-breasted bird boy with a good song? If I had a son, would he be a singer of truths, a sacred root people would want? If I had a son, would he be a singer? Would he be all notes, my boy? If I had a son, would he stand tall with the feet I made him? Would he look to the west where the thunder is a ceremony? Would he say, Papa? I know the songs they sing. Would he say, I am Isis, a small bird in the big scheme of things? If I had a son, would he say, I am blessed to come to this earth. I am blessed to have these bones. Would he know, my son, to keep his eyes low when the old people are singing? Would he know there are roots that stretch far beyond him? If I had a son, He'd be my red-breasted bird boy, and he would know, my son, why the stories matter. He would know, my red-breasted bird boy, why these small bundles need such loving care. Traditionally, in Plains Creek culture, Ovikchitawak, or the worthy young men, had a number of important duties. Among those duties and responsibilities were dancing and feasting, providing for those in need, guarding the women, children, and old people when the camp was being moved, and preparing corpses for burial. They also policed the buffalo hunt, ensuring individual hunters didn't begin the hunt prematurely or break any other rules of the hunt. Ogichitawa were organized into societies which were known as warriors or dancer societies. These societies were led by a warrior chief, and the worthy young men from these societies carried prestige by demonstrating their disassociation from sentiments held by common people. When an Ogichitao died in battle, the usual ceremonies of mourning were not observed because he had willingly courted death. Today, however, Ogichitawa or Ogichitao Skowa, warrior women, refers to people who are generous and who are brave leaders and spokespeople in many different capacities. And now I'm going to tell about storytellers. As a little boy, when my late auntie told me stories, I would close my eyes and I would go to the places she told me about. I could see everything, the frozen trees crackling by the lake, the wagon and horses traveling by moonlight, the old ladies laughing and sewing late into the night, and my auntie is a little girl watching and listening to them gossip and tell stories. Or I could see Wisakija, the trickster, picking the scab from his bum, or even how he tripped the ducks and geese into coming to his blind dance. I could also see the chapel at St. Martin's Residential School and Sister Dennis, tall and black like a crow in her nun's habit, pecking at my auntie and her chum Agnes for drinking the sacramental wine when they were supposed to be cleaning the altar. As a little boy, I could see all of these things, and all of these things I took into myself, and all of these things I've carried for years. They live in my storied memory, and because of them, because of my auntie, I wanted to pitch my camp. I wanted to pitch my lodge in a camp of storytellers. And now I'm going to tell about storytellers. When I was a young man, 
I could not find myself in the books of libraries or in the school curriculum, which was largely based upon another nation's telling of how they came to occupy our lands. I could not find myself in the classrooms of these schools or in the ways I was expected to behave. I could not find myself in the stories of classmates or teachers. And so, as a young man, Oskinigi, and like my name, Omachio, the hunter, I set off to hunt stories that I could feast on. But these stories were not easily found. They were hidden in the shelves of used bookstores, filed under Indians of North America. They were, dis they were discarded to thrift stores, long out of print with tattered book jackets. But nonetheless, they were there waiting for me to find them, waiting for me to discover myself, waiting for me to unfold myself as I turn back the pages of N. Scott Mamaday's The Way to Rainy Mountain, or, or Beatrice Mossigny's In Search of April Rain Tree, or most importantly, Maria Campbell's Half-Breed. The more I found stories in which I could see myself, my family, and history, the more I hungered to find my own voice. And so, now I will not talk about why I was born without a voice or how numerous generations of my family had lost their voice. These are stories for another day. What I will talk about, though, is kiskiyi tamoin. I will talk about knowledge. Kayas, in the old days, storytellers like Okichitawa, the worthy young men, carried great responsibility. These tellers of stories had many jobs. Among these, the Achimostatua were historians. They were genealogists. They were archivists and geologists. They were lawyers and counselors. They were doctors and comedians. You see, Kayas, in the old days, the storytellers were very much like Okichitawa, the worthy young men. They were responsible for making people think while they were dancing and feasting. They were responsible for providing comfort and guidance for those in need. They were responsible for using their stories, their knowledge, to guard the women, children, and old, old people. They were responsible for remembering the bodies of those who died and the bodies of those coming to earth. You see, Gaias in the old days, the storytellers were very much like Ogichi Tawak, the worthy young men. These tellers of stories had many jobs. And today, these tellers of stories continue to have many jobs. Today, there are many storytellers. In fact, today, we live in a time when there are three distinct generations of Indigenous writers who use poetry, plays, novels, biography, and memoir to tell our stories. Now that I'm getting to be an old man, a storyteller from the second generation, I think it's good that our young people will not have to look for themselves in used bookstores or leave school in order to find their spirits. I think, too, it is good that the young people who descend from those who wrote the history books are able to sit with our stories, to learn from them, and to make new stories with us. I had done say tekwe anigi niwo oskin gao. Now I wonder what became of those four young men. Gayas, a long time ago, I gave them a story. And now I wonder what they did with it. I wonder if they are telling stories or making songs. And I wonder if they are good men. Mio na bewak. Now, in order to understand my presentation tonight, you will need to unpack the story bundles I just gave you. You will need to lay them out in the sunshine of your thoughts and allow them to breathe. And then you can pick them up and look at them closely. You can turn them over carefully in your thoughts and ask them what gift they are bringing to you. Or you can carry them with you in even smaller bundles, ones that you've already filled with your own stories or you can give them to, to others who like stories, who like to be given magical things. But for today, in this place and on this land which I am standing, I will ask you this. I ask that you honor the breath I've given these stories. When you are walking through this day or any other day, I ask that you think about your own stories, 
the ones that brought you to this place and time. For each of us, no matter the bundles we carry, we are Ogichitawak, Ogichitawa Skowak, we're the young men, we're the young women. Because we are all created from stories, we are all worthy young men, we are all worthy young women who, if we are fortunate, grow into our bones. And because we often move camp throughout our lives, the stories become our shelter, they become our foundation. It is my hope today that I've given you good shelter and that I have spoken nicely and in a good way. Now I wonder what became of those four young men. and you. Now what do you think? Now what do you think about all of this? Mm -hmm.